Got it. We should be live in just one second, Harry. So let's just make sure Facebook is behaving itself, which means I'm probably already live. Yes, we are already live. Good morning, everybody. You're seeing a bit more of me this week than you typically do. Um, I am back for another edition of Tales from the Heart, a podcast from the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. It is 11.09 a.m. on April 28th, 2023. Um, you know, I watch other podcasts and they don't always give the date and time, but because we're in evolving times with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and drug discovery is at such a rapid pace, I think it's really important that we timestamp these things so you know when you're getting information with the understanding that some of this information is fluid and may change over time. Um, so that's why I do the dates. Today, I am joined again by dear friend, Dr. Harry Lever. Good morning, Harry. Hi. And we have two topics that we're going to be addressing in today's uh, podcast. First, April has been genetics April. Um, I was hoping to get another project out to you guys all, but it's going to probably get to you by June, which is a whiteboard education on genetics. Um, but genetics are really a hot topic, and there's... A whole bunch of unpacking we can do on genetics. And I would encourage everybody who didn't watch last night's Big Hearted Warrior tour from um, Northwestern. Uh, we had an excellent talk from a physician on the current understanding of genetics. We dabbled a little bit into the hopes of the future. So I would encourage you to go listen to her talk. Um, it was quite thought provoking and uh, just really state of the art kind of work. So thank you, Lisa, for that. Um, but Harry, you and I have been around HCM a long time, you longer than I, but I've got 27 years in. And when we started this, we suspected there was something genetic, but we didn't really know what it was until probably the late 90s, early 2000s. It started to come into clarity. 2005 is when we did our first commercial genetic testing for HCM. And that market has evolved from costing about $10,000 for one test to out of pocket, maybe two to $300 max. Um, in some cases, that can even be waived. So pricing on genetic testing has gone in the right direction. Utilization has increased, but it's not perfect yet. Um, what do you think in today's world um, about genetic testing in HCM? Well, I think it's important. And I think it would help us uh, look at uh, families and see, uh, you know, who, you know, in other words, if we are... Uh, if a patient is echo negative, gene negative, and so on, and even though somebody else in the family has it, you don't have to keep, really don't have to keep watching them. And, and I think that's important. Uh, right now, uh, it, at least I, I know we're gonna be talking about uh, trying to change the muscle in, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, but you know, that's something, if we really get going on that, it's gonna be really important to know who really has abnormal genes. And so that's going to change how we approach what we're doing. And I, I think that, uh, you know, it's sort of been back and forth about, well, how many people really are gene positive? And, you know, it was uh, some time ago, we thought it was a lot higher. Now we're getting, you know, there's some vacillation, you know, maybe it's only 30% or 40%, but it, you know, we, we, need, we need to keep looking and seeing what we can find, particularly so, if there are going to be new treatments coming out. So let's just talk about why the numbers bounced around and, and changed. And I'm going to hypothesize a little bit here, but I think I'm on target. Um, when we started doing genetic testing, it was relegated to a few centers who had a great deal of understanding of HCM. And these were families who had had bad things happen. So that's, what, that's who used to go to centers, right? It was these big families with lots of complicated generational disease, and they were per percentage-wise probably at a higher number than they are today in HCM centers because we see more mild disease, benign disease, you know, that, that's just a little thick heart. And yes, it's HCM. And yes, you need to do your risk stratification, but it generationally doesn't look like a bad disease in that family. So when we looked at those original families, they probably represented a higher percentage of the HCM clinic than they do today. And when you look at these other people that are coming in that have no mutation identified, there's 
growing evidence that this could be polygenetic, meaning multiple genes might cause disease presentation as well, but we don't know what combination of which genes create the similar phenotype to a sarcomeric mutation. So you might be able to get a blended mutation that looks like the sarcomere mutation acts, but the root cause is, is quite different. So I think the numbers of between 35 and 40% positive hit are accurate, but there's an also really important like three or 4% that get diagnosed with something other than sarcomeric HCM. They get diagnosed with Fabry's disease, amyloidosis, or it's, it's a rule out for sarcoidosis in some cases. So I think what we can learn about what it isn't is as helpful as learning about what it might be. So um, I think genetic testing for everybody in, with a diagnosis of HCM is critical. And I think it's evolving and it's going to become more important as we develop new therapies that are guided to a particular mutation. We haven't treated anybody based on their mutation yet, but it's coming. What those therapies will be, what clinical trials are gonna look like. These are all being designed right now, but you will be getting genetic marker specific. Well, therapies. the other group that we really need to be looking at are these ones that are not very hypertrophied, but have severe outflow tract obstruction because they have mitral valve issues and you know where do they really fit in also i mean uh, <laughs> it's, it's going to be hard to think about treating somebody who has outflow tract obstruction with with uh, you know a, with some gene to or, or a virus to try to change it if it, if the muscle itself isn't very diseased and it's only you know uh, it's only mitral valve issues. So we, all that stuff has to be looked at and sorted out also. Absolutely. So we know the value of genetic testing when it's positive for looking at the rest of the family. But I believe that some of these things are worth repeating and repeating and repeating. So if I'm re repeating myself to somebody who's heard this before, I apologize. But even last night, <clears throat> we had some questions that made me understand that some people just still don't understand. If you have a positive gene in yourself, you need to go up, over, and down the family tree. Parents, siblings, children. And don't assume that you're gonna get clear answers all the time. Some of this is hazy. We had a question last night. I have HCM, I'm the only one in my family, and that she goes off on this explanation and I really appreciated her for it. Like nobody else in my family has this. Well, except for my father's sister. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's nobody. That's not nobody. That's no first degree relatives have identifiable HCM at this time. And as we discussed last night, your father doesn't have it. Says who, who did the echo, who looked at the EKG has somebody really examined him for phenotype of HCM at all? Or did he go to the local cardiologist who did not see overt massive hypertrophy and said, ah, you're fine. So are there subtle signs on echo? How often times do you see an echo report, Harry, that was read in the community as not problematic? And then you look at it and go, oh, hell yes. I know you did it to my cousin. <laughs> so how often does that happen in the real world? Well, that's the question, isn't it? That's a question of particularly if people aren't used to looking at echoes that have that in people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and that's a problem. So the genetics aspect here is her father could be an incomplete penetrance. He carried the gene, he passed it on, and he never expressed disease which can happen. And a couple months back, maybe over a year ago now, I had Perry Elliott on and we talked about his article on prevalence. And if you have a gene, what is the likelihood that you will express it at some point in your life? And that number came out, I think between 80 and 90% likelihood of expression at some point. It could be in your you know, senior years and it could be you know, a geriatric presentation or it could be mild earlier but there's a high likelihood that you'll present. So you can't say nobody in the family has it if, a, if an aunt has it. That's two degrees away 
and dad might be harboring a mutation or disease, but it's beyond clinical detection, it's below clinical detection at this point. So would you, would you agree with that philosophy? Yeah, and I think that it's also uh, the, uh, the problem of time. Uh, I, I had a patient who had, uh, was gene positive, absolutely echo negative at about the age of 15 or 16. And somehow he comes back to see me 10 years later. Hadn't seen him in all that time. And boy, did that echo change. He was really severely hypertrophy. He had severe outflow tract obstruction, which, I mean, there was no hypertrophy to see on the one back 10 years ago. So you need time to look at people. And, and one of the problems with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy we tend to see people at a point in time and you don't, they don't keep always coming back. And, you know, what, what, how are they manifesting this disease when, you know, are, are they really echo negative or are they gene positive, really echo negative? How long does it take for things to change? And it's that, that requires a lot of looking at a lot of people over a long period of time. And, and that hasn't happened really. It, it hasn't happened in the numbers that it needs to happen in, but it's happened enough for us to know right. to be following up regularly. That's right. Well, that's that right. We, we know enough to know that. <clears throat> okay. So we know that there are two heavy hitter genes, two other mild hitter genes, and then a bunch of very tiny parts of the community. So myosin heavy chain Myosin binding protein C are the two most common, each accounting for between 30 and 40% of all of those diagnosed. So if we push that to the top, that's maybe 80% of all the identified gene mutations are in those two genes. Then there are the troponin mutations. Troponin I and troponin T can both impact HCM. And then there's myosin light chain, which is kind of in the, with the troponin numbers in terms of prevalence. And then there's a whole bunch of other little ones that can cause disease and they're responsible for each less than 1% of the population. So obviously we're gonna start with um, looking at these bigger genes to say, is there anything that we can do about these particular types of mutations? Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to do something with me for a moment because as we, as we delve down this next pathway of HCM history, I've been looking at this that, okay, jump down a rabbit hole with me, people. Harry, when you stepped into this world, there was a minor playbook being written by Marin and Brunwald had started with Morrow and there was some, there was some data. We knew a little bit and we've refined it over time. We've defined anatomy over years. We've come up with the utilization of different drugs and agents to help the heart relax or beat better. We came up with surgery, you know, way back in the day. We refined it over time. We added alcohol septal ablation. We tried pacemakers. It didn't quite work. We divided the group into risk stratification and we thought we'd figure out who was at high risk and needed a defibrillator. Sudden death risks are down, way down. We're doing great there. Disease recognition improving. Disease management, patients aren't satisfied yet. 52% of patients surveyed by the HCMA are somewhat, somewhat satisfied with their therapies. So that means there's a lot of room to do more work in. So that's in the playbook number one. And we're not getting rid of playbook number one, but we're adding playbook number two. And that is genetically targeted therapies. And this is a whole different kind of thinking. And HCMA will be working to develop some educational models for both patients and clinicians on how to think about these topics. This is all coming up uh, because this is a new, new territory. Currently in the United States, over 5,000 or nearly 5,000 individuals have been dosed with some sort of genetic therapy. Sickle cell anemia has been successfully treated with this type of an approach. Hemophilia has been successfully treated. There have been marked improvements in the Duchenne muscular dystrophy space because of genetic therapies. And they're coming to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. 
And this is a crazy, exciting, scary new place to be. Harry, we've seen a lot. The concept of genetic therapy to you as a physician who has witnessed disease decade over decade, what do you think about the concept? Well, I think it's something that really needs to be carefully looked at. I mean, it's it's been tried in other diseases for other purposes, obviously. And I think, you know, we, but we have to be very careful and we have to be careful who we choose to try this on. Uh, you know, uh, we certainly don't want to give gene therapy to somebody who isn't very sick, you know, the heart's a little thick and, you know, no, no, we, we have to do it in people who are, you know, looking like maybe they're getting towards the end stage. Maybe start with that. See if we can, you know, see what realizing though that if we make if we start with people that are too sick, there may be no chance that it's going to work. But you you sort of have to look at and get an idea in small numbers of patients to get some idea what's going to happen. And that's going it's going to take some time. And it's going to you know we we but but it's in it's encouraging that there are people out there that are beginning to think about it. And I think that, you know, it's not like we can run out and do something tomorrow and, you know, give it to hundreds of people. No, no, but, 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 you know, small numbers to get some preliminary idea of where it stands and knowing, you know, uh, looking at some of these companies, the, 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 the few that they are going to try, well, patients should already, already say, have a defibrillator. You know, and you've, you've already done something to protect that patient. So that, <laughs> and that, you know. it's, it's an interesting point. Um, and I, I don't disagree um, for the first handful of people. I think it's, it's an absolute must. However, as it evolves, I'm, I'm, a, I'm curious to see what the community thinks. And we're going to do a focus group um, coming up very soon to talk about these issues. Um, but would you wear a life vest for a month or two if you didn't have a defibrillator or didn't have risk? And, and is that protective enough? They're a little uncomfortable, but it's only as your heart is responding to this new agent. So, um, or material, I should call it. So I think we are in literally game-changing times. I don't use this terminology lately. So I've explained a little bit about this. Um, I want I want to take everybody down a, a different rabbit hole for a minute. So think about the human body from the outside. Think about the heart as a muscle. We've seen images of it. Think about HCM walls being too thick. But now I want you to think what's inside of those walls. We don't really talk about it too, too much. Like what does, what is the wall made of? What does that cell look like? How come it's acting inappropriately? Why are we struggling to control our myosin? Where is it going? Is it depleting? Why are we putting in new material? That's the goal is to put in a protein that will help us develop good myosin. That's it. So some drugs affect the body in one way. And sometimes we can now get inside of the muscle, inside of the cell and repair what was wrong to begin with. This is completely hypothetical right now, people. These are trials. They call them trials for a reason. <laughs> so if you're going to start asking me really hard questions of like, who should be doing this and how well does it work? We don't know if it works at all. We hypothesize that it will work because it's worked in mice. It's worked in other lab animals. We have proof that the DNA message, the little protein piece got to its destination. So it got to the cardiac sarcomere, it got in there, it did the job. And step one of a trial is, are we getting to the destination? Success is not curing that individual of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Success is seeing that you put it in the vein and it did get to the heart muscle and it is permeating through the heart muscle. That's success at stage one to me. And then you figure out the dosing and how much do you have to add to make it change the disease completely for the long term. So ladies and gentlemen, it is cool times. It's really, really cool times. And we really want to work together on this. But you first have to get genetic testing. 
And if you don't get genetic testing, you don't know that you might be a candidate for this or not. And if you're not a candidate for this, there is great interest in starting to organize the no mutation found population and doing deeper studies, looking at whole genome sequencing, looking for these other targets. And that's how you get to the next step. If you're not one of these target mutations, which constellation of mutations are you? And then can we find which one seems to be the bad guy and treat that bad guy so the rest of them are, are not going to do their thing anymore? So there's so much cool stuff happening. It's a little mind-blowing. What do you think, Harry? Well, I think that, you know, it's, it, it is potentially exciting times here. We have to, you know, we have to uh, look at this deeper and, you know, get more data and see what we see. You know, I mean, uh, FDA has allowed one company to use five or six patients, and that's a start. Yeah, we'll, we'll just have to see, you know, what happens. But 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 at this at the same time, we can't jump off the bridge and just start doing it. I mean, we've got oh hell no, we got to be very careful about this kind of stuff. So and, we're going to get and into make other... sure that we're so there's a there's a element of protecting patients too. You know, you've got to, you know, and that's why you, most of the time when you start out with new therapies, you start out with people that are sicker and you, you know, and, you know, and, and that you don't have a tremendous amount to offer them. Now there's, there, there, there's a problem though, that maybe they've gone on already too far, but you gotta, you know, it's, it's sort of a start. And that's, that's sort of what you have to, to do where you're looking at people that are really in trouble and seeing if you can alter them. Because if you could alter somebody who's really in trouble and you had had nothing otherwise to offer them, that's a big deal. I mean, if you, if you really turn somebody around who was really, really in trouble and was heading down the street for a heart transplant and all of a sudden they don't need it, that's, that's really good. But that, that you know, that's more, <laughs> more away from, you know, we've got to wait and see what happens. So I will dive into a little bit of patient selection. Um, I am working with, we are, HCMA is working with two different companies, actually three different companies who are developing genetic therapies. And we're having deep conversations with them about these topics. And I've had the opportunity to meet with scientists and, and immunologists and hepatologists and HCM experts and gene people. Like we've had some deep conversations, people, um, amazingly intelligent, articulate brains who are working on our problem. And immuno, so what you're going to have to do to load any gene therapy, and this isn't HCM, this is everything. Um, you have to knock down the immune system a bit so that the virus can, it, it's a virus directed therapy. So it's, it's an AAV9 capsid delivery system. So AAV9 has been used in a number of other clinical trials for genetic therapies, and it seems to be the proper way to, to get it in there. Um, as many of you found out through COVID, when you get a virus, it has a tracer in it. it it's got a marker and it impregnates you. And that's how you know that you've ever had that virus. So you have a marker in your genetics that will say that you had that virus. Um, in this case, the virus that you would have is a, is a loaded with myosin binding protein C protein. So it's going to deliver that to the heart and you have to let the heart accept that. So you have to drop the immune system so it doesn't fight it off. So you will go on medications that are used in transplant to get somebody ready to have a transplanted organ. So there's going to be some steroid use for a couple of weeks and then um, either tacrolimus or serolimus, which are I take tacrolimus for transplant. So they are immunotherapy. They, they drop your immune system so that your body doesn't reject this therapy. So you can't do that in somebody who's on the brink of a transplant because it's a hit to the system and you might get a little sick. And if you're otherwise healthy, it's, it's like you're going to have a cold. Um, but if you're heading towards transplant, that might be a little too much for that body to handle. And we don't want to put you in any more of a predicament. So if you're listed, you're probably not going to be a candidate. I had originally thought that that would be the best candidate because then we'd get the heart and we'd see if it permeated. But the concept of getting the drug into the heart may just be too hard for those people. So I'm not so sure that they're the right person. 
If I could turn back time to 2011 when my ejection fraction dropped for the first time and I kind of knew that within seven years I'd probably transplant, then maybe in 2011, I would have been a good candidate for something like this. But after that, I don't think so. Like when, when I saw the change, but I still had time, that might've been a good time for me personally. Um, I am a myosin binding protein C mutation. I am the population they're looking for. Um, I'm no longer a candidate because my heart doesn't have HCM, but people who are showing advanced disease, people who look like they might go to transplant at some point, people who have a little scar, not a lot, who have a thick heart, but not too thick, can't be too thin. So there's, as they were calling it, the Goldilocks person, like something not, not too big, not too small, just right. Um, we're going to have to find that person. Those That's people. going to be hard to do that though. It's going to be very hard to do. And on top of all of those clinical features that need to be there, there needs to be a certain mindset in that individual that with big risk comes potential of big reward and they have to want to lean into that. And that is a personal decision. And I would not blame anybody for not making that decision. Um, I, I would be... I would be impressed with the bravery it shows to be those, to be those first few people. And I've spoken to a few who want it and I, I appreciate them. And we're going to need those people to see what's going to happen. And we're going to do everything we can to keep them safe through this whole process. And safety is more than the physical administration of the medication. This is a long-term prospect. We have to keep watching over time to see how things progress. They need to be patient um, and they need to be, it's to be patient, willing, and brave. And, and whoever they're going to be, we appreciate them. Um, somebody asked a question here. I'm going to go back to just genetic testing. Uh, Vicki asked, is there any free testing? I'm positive, but my kids and grandkids are not tested. Uh, most insurance companies will pay for confirmatory testing. So it should not be more than your out-of-pocket copay and deductible. Um, there might still be some um, free tests available from both Invite and Ambry through their programs, but they will bill your insurance company first, and then they have some uh, assistance programs. Um, so that's, that's still possible. And if you have any problems, give us a call and we'll see if we can't help you out. Um, Tina, you think Americans have so much more than Britain? Well, I got to tell you something. The British Heart Foundation has funded a $30 million project to develop genetic therapies. So, you know, UK and Europe, like I know you're not one anymore. I know you had a breakup and it was bad, um, but I think it's going to be okay in, in this space because there's some really smart minds in Europe and in UK and, and in uh, Great Britain who are really fighting for genetic therapies as well. Um, they're not ready to dose yet, but I think they're going to be close behind and that's a good thing. And what we learn here, the world learns from. So it's it's a good thing. Um, Harry, any other thoughts on genetics before we move on to medicines? Because it's an important day in HCM history. No, I think, you know, I think again, we just have to be aware that it's something to look at, but realize that we're really early in it. And I'm not so sure that, you know, when you're talking about uh, therapy that's going to inter interfere with your immunity, I still think. No, 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 no. It's not going to interfere with your immunity. No, you have no, to no. drop the immunity and then that goes away after 60 days. Yeah, I understand. But when you're still talking about people who you're going to alter that, had they not, you know, I, I think we still got to be looking at maybe sicker people than. Than, than people who aren't quite so sick. I mean, I think you gotta be really careful about this. This is brand new therapy and we gotta be really careful about it. I could not agree more or more adamantly. And I, I know it's a new book yeah. and we have no idea what chapter two holds for us, let alone the end of the book. Right. So we're, we're writing it as we're living it and People are moving slowly and cautiously. And I think there are some really exciting, scary things happening. We aren't going to be making a big fanfare when the first person gets dosed because 
it's, we're going to need time to know if anything worked exactly. and what complications that there might be. And there are some significant ones and we're going to talk about them. So we're going to have a whole series. We're going to bring in a bioethicist to talk. We're going to bring in an immunologist to talk. We're going to bring in HCM experts to talk. We're not, we are not taking this lightly. I personally am not taking this lightly. This may turn out to be some of the most important work we've ever done. And it's, it's complicated work. So bear with us as we build, ask questions. It'll help us develop more tools and we're happy to keep the conversation going. And if you have a known diagnosis of myosin binding protein C specifically, or any of the troponin mutations, we will be holding a focus group. Stay tuned for more information because I want to have a real conversation just with those who are genetically positive, who may be the first to use this type of therapy. We want to make sure we're asking all the right questions and that we've got all the support you need for going into this therapy, for recovering, making sure your family has expectations of what's going to be required from them during this process. There's a lot going on here and we're going to do our absolute best to provide you with the information that you need to make good decisions for yourself and your family. That said, we have a little experience in that because back in 2014, we heard of this new concept of a myosin inhibitor. And um, we went from concept to a year ago yesterday, the FDA approved Camzios, the first labeled indication drug for the treatment of obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, the label is likely, likely to be expanded um, on or about June 16th. That's the PDUFA date, the day that the FDA has to get back to BMS for use of Mavicamptin in those who otherwise would be recommended to septal reduction therapy. So you don't necessarily have to be class two, three, you could be class one, two, but still have a really big gradient and be being referred for surgery. And those patients would be now open to, to the utilization of labeled indication use CAMSIOS. There's been about 2000 patients dosed there's been almost 3,000 physicians who have been REMS certified. The number doesn't quite work. A lot of people got REMS certified thinking they were going to do things. And hopefully they thought better that the dosing of CAMSIOS should be relegated to HCM specialty centers while we're learning about it. And that's where the majority of the prescriptions are coming from. So I, I'm happy about that. The response from the community has been almost identical to the clinical trial results. A third are really happy with the results and their gradients are gone and their lifestyles improved and they're happy, happy campers. The middle third have seen a reduction in gradient and maybe some mild improvement in quality of life and, and are kind of hanging on saying, let's see if it gets better. And then a third don't respond. And we've seen an uptick in myectomies in the past maybe 60 days. I think people waited for Camzios and they gave it a try and for whatever their reasons they decided no, they just wanted a, a quicker fix and they went with surgery. Um, but I think they both have really important roles to play in patient management in this day and age. Harry, what do you think about where we are right now in this new myosin inhibitor age? Well, I think it's, uh, it's something else that you can try. We, you know, we have, uh, um, it's, it's, it's new concept and it, uh, new drug and, you know, and, and importantly, it's, um, name brand it's not genetic generic it's not generic <laughs> because that's another problem we've had problems with drugs that are made by companies who didn't make them before and they're not always coming out right and that's another major problem that's caused us all kind of issues and i that that's a whole other thing and i but i think it has to be concerned and sometimes when people aren't doing well um they, uh, it may be just because the drug itself wasn't made right. And that's another, that's something I've been very interested in. And, you know, we've got to be aware of that. And that's. We don't have that problem with a new drug that is made right. by the original manufacturer. That's we have better manufacturing standards. That's right. Um, and, and I think that provides some reassurance for patients that this is the real drug. It's not a generic, right. uh, it's the real thing. So we've, we've done quite well there. Um, so let's, there's, there's a lot I could say about the experience of 
launching a new drug and, and the first year with the things that we've learned as a patient advocacy organization, we've learned about how payers are responding to this. Most payers are being pretty good about it. Um, a couple are unnecessarily requiring step therapy. Um, we have been writing letters to insurance companies around the country saying, where'd you come up with this idea? Because it did not come from HGM experts. So we want clinicians to be able to prescribe what's needed for the patient and have insurance companies uh, not question a doctor. I'm a little tired of insurance companies trying to play doctor. Their insurance companies, let them have their role. Um, we had one case where somebody was required to go on a uh, calcium channel blocker for a 90-day trial. Um, they did not tolerate it within a few days and the insurance company still wants them to wait. So we're in appeals right now with them and we're going to fight. We're going to fight for oh, this person. There's no excuse for that. And, yeah. and somebody has got to tell insurance companies they're not to be practicing medicine. And they, they do it all the time. Well, it, it, the problem is they may do it all the time, but we've got to be tougher and point out to them that, that, that you don't do that. And maybe some of them have to be taken uh, uh, legally to, you know, they're practicing medicine without a license. And that's a very serious problem. And I think that that, that cannot go on. That, that's, there's too much of that. We, we are too much interfering with the care of patients because insurance companies are making decisions. That's not right. I got so there was an out. article um, a couple of weeks ago um, about Cigna and how their chief or their medical officers can deny 300,000 claims in 20 seconds. And I don't know how many of you have gotten things denied in the past and they just figure you'll go away. Appeal, appeal, appeal. Right. Go to your third level of appeal. They very rarely win their third level of appeal. And if you're a member of the HCMA, we will help you write your appeal letters. We can't do it for everybody because it is time consuming. So we do relegate that one service to members only um, because it costs a lot of money to, to do that. So we're happy to do it for members and we can give some instruction over the phone on how you might want to do it. But immediately they send you a letter that says we're not, you appeal. You immediately go in for a first appeal. You'll win a percentage of those. They'll, they'll deny again. You appeal again. If you have to go do an external review, do it. We'll be by your side and we'll help you get the right people on your team to, to fight that. Um, and it almost doesn't matter what it is. You need a myectomy at a high volume center. You want CAMS IOS and they won't give it to you. You need an ICD and the insurance company said, no, I've seen that happen. We, we win 95% of our appeals and the 5% were technical issues that we lost on, but we win a lot of our appeals. So if they say no to us. So let's talk about another drug for our last few minutes here that um, has been around for a long time and um, has been used with a great degree of success in a small part of our population. And that's NorPACR, which is the name brand in controlled release of disopyramide. Um, Mark Sherrod's done extensive work in this space and documented its effectiveness as have the team up in Toronto. But we were using it as an off-label use for all these years. And we've had problems with shortages and outages because they just don't make enough. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after 20 years of being pushed <laughs> and a new mechanism by the FDA, Pfizer has applied for what's called real world label indication authorization of NORPACR, which would mean it would be a labeled indication drug for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy providing another opportunity for the treatment of symptomatic obstructive HCM. And it's been quite effective in the, in the uh, controlling of atrial fibrillation. So it can work on two different mechanisms. So it's in for review right now. This is a new process from the FDA and they're only going to approve a few drugs at a time in this new process. I can't guarantee that NORPACR will be one that was chosen in the earliest days. There's been a bunch of submissions. They went in in March. Um, and I don't exactly know when we're going to hear back, I think by June. Um, but if they don't get it this time, they're going to reapply again. 
And it was nice for Pfizer to step up and do this. They didn't have to, but we've been bugging them for all these years and they finally took a motion here. What do you think about that, Harry? I think that's a good idea. It certainly would give us another another drug to use. And, and again, uh, Pfizer making it that some other brand X won't be, at least for a few years. And uh, that's, you know, I think that that's positive. If just if FDA will go along with, with it, and I think that hopefully they will. But that's, that's <laughs> they know how to make it. And so we won't be so worried about you getting something that doesn't work. I think that's great. And generic Norpace is annoying because you have to dose it so often because it doesn't have a good half-life and it is generic and we don't know how fast it dumps. And, and if you don't have enough in your system, you're not going to fix your obstruction and you're, you're going to be bouncing around all day. So what else should patients think about medical management in general? Should they be willing to take a medication? Should they try to avoid taking medications for their well, HGM? No, I think that, that medicines do work if, if they're dosed properly and if they're made by proper companies. And I think we, you know, I think it, it's, uh, but it, ha, you know, it has to be carefully watched. I mean, it's, uh, um, you know, beta blockers still have positive effects. Unfortunately, over the years, there haven't been enough studies done, believe that or not. I mean, you know, we, we started out with beta blockers, a simple one, a propranolol, and, you know, people just sort of did it, but they didn't really look at studies. You know, we don't have enough of that and probably would help to look more at that. I mean, there's a diltiazem as a calcium channel blocker that, you know, in my experience does help some people, but very, very few studies looking at it. And uh, so there is some good news here. There's going to be a head to head study from Cytokinetics on Afficamptin versus Metropolol, Topril. So I think that's an interesting study design. I'm hoping they're using name brand Topril. I think they are. If not, I'll talk to them. Um, Cyto, Topril, not generic, um, okay. as a control. And I think if we compare the two, I think it's going to be interesting to see right. where where the differences are. There could be a use of both at once um, that might add to benefit, or we may not need the beta blocker at all. Maybe the myosin inhibitor is that much better. Well, we got to find out. And, I don't know. And we'll and again, we've got to be very careful about this unknown of generic drugs. I mean, it's really up, it's become a major problem for lots of diseases. And one of the problems that we've also seen is when a manufacturer gets changed by the pharmacy, the doctor isn't notified and the patient suddenly starts not doing so well. So that's, that uh, um, needs to be very carefully looked at. You know, is a patient failing because the drug itself isn't made right and you have to know what you're taking. And you, that's, that's a major problem with pharmacies today. They just don't, they just change the drug and don't tell the patient. And, the, and, the, and if the patient isn't aware that the color of the drug has changed or the whatever identification has changed, you're in trouble. So that, that's a major problem. That is, that is interfering with, there are a lot of people starting to think about this now. And we're, we're, we're uh, hopefully something's gonna happen. So something else has happened and I'm just learning something else here. Um, so CVS Caremark is back at it. Um, I, for those who don't recall, about a year and a half ago, they decided to put Eliquis off of their list and everybody was supposed to use Zeralto instead but there's reasons why some people can't take Zeralto and CVS Caremark. It took us six months advocating with them to put Eliquis back on formulary. Well, they've just taken Moltac off of their formulary and they want to switch everybody to amiodarone. <laughs> so there's another fight on that one. Again, practicing medicine without a license here or non-medical switching. People get used to the term non-medical switching. PBMs think they can play your doctor. And 
you can you can do population medicine to a certain degree, but patients are individuals. And there are reasons doctors choose particular drugs for them. And CVS Caremark and other PBMs should keep their nose out of that relationship. Would you agree, Harry? Yeah, absolutely. And one of the things that has worried me about these new anticoagulants is the patient's uh, level of anticoagulation is not measured. Whereas with Coumadin, you could always know what the INR time was and know, know where the patient stood. So when these drugs go generic, we're going to have a real problem knowing how well are, are we going to, the only way are we going to know that the patient is over anticoagulated is that they're going to hemorrhage. I mean, this is a problem. We've got to, we, we've got to figure out ways to know, you know, because these are dangerous drugs and, and, you know, we don't have good ways of measuring their effectiveness. And that's a major problem. If, if, if you, you know, uh, so that, that, that in itself is a problem. So I, I, so guess what? They've also added to this list. They need pre-authorization for Norpace. I, I didn't even know this. I'm just finding this out right now. So if you're CVS Caremark, they're going to push you back from, oh, look, Zetia too. So my, my uh, anti uh, 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 cholesterol absorption inhibitor post-transplant, I'm going to need to get pre auth by that because this is my pharmacy now. Um, so that's awesome. Uh, so they're, they're pushing you from the, from Norpace to disapyramide. They want you to use the formulary option. So they want you to use the generic. And we just explained why Norpace is better in name brand. Okay. So yeah, I love that they want patients to use amiodarone instead of Moltac. Well, they got to realize that amiodarone is a very, very toxic drug. And it's not to say we don't use it. We do use it. It has, but you've got to be so careful using it. You got to look at the thyroid function. You got to look at the pulmonary function, liver you know, function, liver function, you know, all that stuff. And you got to use yeah. the, lo the lowest dose possible. You don't just whip this drug out and just give it to somebody. I, you know, that's, I mean, it, 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 no question, it's an effective drug, but they've never been able to absolutely make it safe in terms of doing something to prevent some of these side effects, you know, and, it, and you got to do the pulmonary function. You don't want to get pulmonary fibrosis and all this stuff, you know, it needs to be dealt with. And it's, you know, excuse me, you don't practice medicine without a license. And they won't, they won't cover beta pace anymore. They want generic soda wall. They're pushing everything away from the brand names and all well, over to the generics, which we know well, are a problem. What's going to have to happen is the drugs have to be tested. We're going to have to test the effectiveness of the drugs. That means blood levels. That means lots of, lots of stuff. And, you know, can you send me that? wherever you got that information. I'm going to drop the link in our chat box here and you can pull it up when we finish doing our little podcast here, which we've, we've gotten down a rabbit hole together and we're both. So if everybody wants to know how Harry and I speak to each other, I actually kind of forgot that we were podcasting for a minute and just like, oh my God, this is what they're doing. So um, now that you're watching it in live time, CVS Caremark, if you're watching, you're making a mistake. You're going to make people sick you're going to hurt patients, you're going to add to the burden of practicing medicine for clinicians and for nurse practitioners and office staff. You've done nothing here but save yourself a couple of dimes on a drug and you've put people in harm's way. And I stand by that statement. Um, and, and I hope you call me out on this and I hope we can discuss this in front of a congressional hearing someday because what you're doing is dangerous. My sister died because of amiodarone. She went toxic at the age of 36 on amniodarone. My sister didn't die from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. She died of the treatment for her hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which included nor, or, or both Norpace and amniodarone. And she dropped out her potassium and had a cardiac arrest in her sleep at 36. Brilliant move, Caremark. You're going to put more people at risk for this type of a complication because you don't see that with Moltac. 
atrial fibrillation patients who are taking Multac, you're now going to ask them to go on amiodarone for life in their 40s and their 50s. You're insane. Whoever made that decision, you are morally bankrupt. I'm going to shut up now. Harry, I love speaking with you. I love getting passionate about patient safety with you. Thank you for joining us on Tales from the Heart. And thank you to our sponsors, Bristol Myers Squibb, Cytokinetics, Tanaya Therapeutics, Imbria Pharmaceutical, and newly added BioMarin. Um, and just as a moment of transparency here, yes, drug companies and pharmaceutical companies and genetic therapies company sponsor the work of the Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Association. There is no quid pro quo relationships between the HCMA and our sponsors. They sponsor us because they believe in the work that we're doing to educate and enlighten the community. Therapies will, bal will balance and some people will do better on one company's drug and some people will do better on another. Options are what are important. Transparency and relationships are important too. CVS Caremark makes a lot of money and they're taking it from the patients and they're taking it from the employers who are paying premiums and they're giving you back garbage and they're putting you at risk with policies like this. Speak with your wallet, speak with your choices on healthcare access. They own a major part of the, the, the sphere of the, of the PBM market. It's kind of hard to not go near them. And if you're with Aetna, you're forced in. So when you have your chance for health plan selection at your employer, because that's where 70% of Americans get their health care, look very closely at where your prescription benefits are coming from and look at the history of those companies and how patient-centric they really are. Because telling somebody they can't have Multac and they need to be on amniodarone and they can't have Norpace, they have to be on short-acting disopyramide is not about patient safety and proves that they don't give a damn about how you feel and what the long-term consequences are. So we all have to talk about these things and come to solutions. This is not a solution. This is a problem. So uh, CVS Caremark, I might be a quarter late finding this stuff out, but I'm on it now, baby. And we'll be talking about it. Harry, thanks. Have a great day. Yeah.